Hi, everyone. Thanks um, for being here today. I know everyone is super busy right now and it's early. And so I appreciate you joining us today. And also thanks to our moderators for all of their support and helping me get all my tech stuff sorted out. Um, so I work in Emory Libraries and my team is um, teaching and learning technologies. So we support instructional technology on campus and we've largely been handling the move to online with our Canvas LMS, um, using Zoom, and in some cases other tools. Um, I also used to be a librarian. I'm still a librarian by nature and very much feel connected to the library communities. And Oh, think. So, like everybody else here, uh, Emory has had a crazy month since um, having to move all of our courses online and make other arrangements. Um, we're not just shifting how we work, but there's a lot of other stressors going on uh, related to this pandemic. Um, but it's been really inspiring to see my colleagues at Emory and my colleagues elsewhere rising to the challenge and doing everything they can to make sure that people still get a good educational experience. So I know that everybody right now probably already has video conferencing fatigue. So I tried to make my keynote a little bit more participatory and not just me talking at you for 40 minutes. So we're going to do a couple of thought exercises uh, in a little bit. And we'll be using Padlet, uh, which is a web tool uh, where you can post. Uh, it's kind of like a, an online message board or like cork board type tool. Um, and we're going to contribute our ideas about distance learning in the context of what's happening now. The uh, moderators are going to provide the links to those at the appropriate time. Um, you don't need an account to participate. You can simply um, create a new entry uh, by clicking on the bottom right there, the plus tab uh, that you can click to create a new entry. And you can do it anonymously, or if you want to put your name on it, that's cool too. Um, just so you know, if you do want to create an account, uh, which takes about one to two minutes, or log in with your Google account, Microsoft, or Apple accounts, um, that takes about 10 seconds, um, that will allow you to go back and edit your previous entries if you want to do that. But again, no need to actually um, join Padlet or sign in. So obviously, I am a fan of distance learning. My career is dedicated to helping make that happen, as well as blended learning and face-to-face -face learning using technology. And I'm currently completing my second online master's degree through UGA. Um, the word distance, though, kind of has taken on a bit of a negative connotation because of this whole social distancing thing and everything feeling, um, you know, we're feel really feeling the impacts of that distance. Um, so I feel a little differently about that word than I did a month ago. Not all negative, but, you know, just has changed my context. And in the dictionary, distance is defined as an amount of space between two things or people. Usually that's by choice, though, um, and it's not enforced. So the whole social distancing thing, it's very necessary right now for public health reasons, but it can be very frustrating, exhausting, um, you know, sometimes lonely, and it's been very difficult in a lot of ways. Um, but in that definition of distance, I like the fact that it mentions space because space can be something that you fill with nothing or you can fill it with a lot of things, anything potentially. Uh, and I think that what we decide to put there as distance educators, as people participating in 
online learning and leading that charge, um, there's you know a lot of potential there for what we can do. So a major theme right now that I'm seeing on social media, hearing from colleagues, reading in the news, is a loss of a sense of community and connection with others. Um, in terms of distance learning, you know, when you're expecting to have your classes face to face and then you're forced to go online, you know, people are saying this, you know, it's just not the same and it's challenging for a lot of reasons. Uh, but also there's, you know, some, you know, feelings about that. And even though I love distance learning, I can't disagree with a lot of those sentiments about how, you know, it's really a totally different context um, and experience to have to move online. So everyone's feeling the disadvantages of that in some way or another. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, changing how we uh, deliver learning, and in other cases, some places have had to cease learning in general if they don't have the capacity to continue. But distance learning, um, a kind of perpetual challenge, even in normal times, is um, how do you build a community? Um, and now that dilemma is magnified because distance learning, if we are continuing learning at all, uh, is all we have. So we're able to see its faults and shortcomings very clearly right now. But there's still a lot of ways that, um, that it can grow and a lot of potential there. Um, so with that in mind, my kind of theme for the day is how do we create a sense of community and online learning despite having that distance? And how do we as educators support that? Another definition for community um, is, well, the dictionary gives a lot of different definitions. There were maybe like 10 different definitions of community, which I found interesting. It can be a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common, or a body of nations or states unified by common interests, or a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. So community can be a lot of different things, and that's largely going to be defined by the people who belong to that community. In the context of learning, communities give a sense of common shared learning goals, interests, as well as um, the spaces and people in which to engage with those interests and goals. And Alexander Aston, who's the founding director of UCLA's Higher Education Research Institute, describes learning communities like this. Such communities can be organized along curricular lines, common career interests, avocational interests, residential living areas, and so on. These can be used to build a sense of group identity, cohesiveness, and uniqueness, to encourage continuity and the integration of diverse curricular and co-curricular experiences, and to counteract the isolation that many students feel. Learning, as much research has shown is inherently social as well as emotional and so what teachers say the way that they say it um, the activities students participate in their learning how they're able to interact with their peers all have an impact on things like retention interest effort motivation ultimately their academic achievement um, and again building online community can be a challenge when some of the factors that are there in the face-to-face -face setting aren't present. And right now, we're especially feeling that because they were there in those cases, and now they're being taken away. So now that we're in this new situation, however temporary, we have to figure out how do we reconstruct our communities with what we have. In some cases, students aren't getting what they need, whether it's academically, whether it's socially, or whether it's on an emotional level, feeling stress and lack of support. Um, and the loss of, of learning community is being felt in a lot of different ways. And the, those are contributing to consequences ranging from 
not being able to continue education as planned, being able to continue it but in a different way, to not even being able to complete coursework, to stress and mental health issues. So, so looking at some of the deficiencies that we have right now, So obviously, because of social distancing, we are lacking those usual physical spaces where we can mean to share our interests, discuss learning topics, um, gather collectively to learn and to teach. And those don't just include places like libraries and classrooms, but also, you know, coffee shops, even places um, in, the, in the university setting off campus where students might just bond with each other. Um, and all these places have contexts. And so moving online, we have a completely different context where we're isolated and that can feel really jarring. Um, so we're moving to these online spaces in a lot of cases. And that was very different in the way that we interact um, than being in the same space as, as uh, our learning community peers. In some remote areas, there might be no spaces. They might not be able to be moving online because they don't have the resources for that. And so there's a complete lack of physical space. Um, so resources like books, journal articles, all the things that libraries provide, as well as human resources, services, things like student groups, um, those are largely lost in this move to online. So all of these are supports that um, instructors and students, as well as staff, um, need to stay functioning and thriving. And, you know, with lack of access to you know, physical spaces like libraries, um, there's no place to go to, you know, collectively study or gather to look at a particular topic for a class. For, as far as online access, you know, we're lucky to be able to have access to ebooks and databases, but some do not. Um, and so, those um, open educational resources um, may be the only option or a better option for some people. Um, and in some cases, you know, there may be a complete lack of, uh, you know, resources that uh, work to be able to continue education. And um, instructors are having to rethink and retool how they're going to deliver their lessons, how they're going to deliver assessments. Um, at Emory, we're helping faculty figure out how can they um, kind of remap their syllabus um, so that they can still meet their learning objectives. Basically starting from square one, because they have had activities planned, but those may not necessarily work online. And it's hard to try to like find the equivalent. So starting back at baseline with what are the learning goals and you know going from there to develop something that works in an online environment is very challenging and frustrating for everybody. Um, and you know, we're having to make some sacrifices in terms of what can be done uh, in the remainder of the semester, um, given that we have these limitations. Also, availability of technology and access to technology, of course, is a factor. Um, so a lot of people who are um, teaching, face-to-face, -face, you know, they may have nothing against online learning, but they don't have experience with it. So they're not accustomed to using different tools. Um, you know, we've had to get people caught up on using things like Canvas and Zoom and Screencast-O-Matic to make and introducing the concept of flip classrooms. Um, so, you know, and students are looking to their 
instructors to lead them and guide them and have those skills and technology. And so, you know, that's where we come in and are trying to provide as much support as we can. But, you know, there's uh, other limitations like time um, that we have to consider. You know, we have to wrap up the semester pretty soon. And so we've had to, you know, sometimes just use the basics and sometimes less is more because you also have to consider what's the practicality for your use case and our use cases. Well, we just need to like get the stuff online as quick as possible so people can feel some sense of continuity. And the digital divide is really um, coming into play here because in some cases it determines whether people will have ac equal access to their education or access at all. And so we're really seeing how, you know, we don't, we, as librarians, I mean, we think about this regularly, but we don't necessarily see it. And now it's like really coming to the surface that, oh, we have students who like when they go home, they just don't have access to um, reliable internet connection or they don't have uh, their own computers that they can use and so forth. Um, so there are a lot of different situations we're seeing related to technology access. And then time. Um, time is kind of a weird abstract thing right now. Some days I even am forgetting like, you know, what day it is because uh, everything kind of blurs together. And in terms of time for getting work done, for delivering instruction, for um, students to complete their work, um, for educators, obviously having to prepare uh, and replace lessons and assessments really quickly um, has been difficult. And so there's the time limitation there. And then everybody has other stuff that they're dealing with, whether they have to homeschool their kids or they have to, you know, handle, you know, like, you know, I need to get my groceries somehow, a lot having anxiety about going out and just doing an errand. You know, there's a lot of things that are impacting people's time differently now. Um, and then there's just that, you know, being stuck at home, like everything blurring together, um, everybody's still in that adjustment period of like how do I manage time when like every aspect of my life is in the same physical place because um, usually we have that separation um, and then of course different time zones um, some students are in different time zones than their peers and uh, and their instructors and so accommodations need to be made in which you know they may not be able to meet synchronously so much with their class. So all these aspects have really upended face-to-face -face learning communities um, and along with the absence or change in these factors, there's also the new social contexts where, again, interactions may not always be synchronous due to practical reasons. Um, communication is a little bit more broken up and choppy and maybe inconsistent and accessible. There's a lack of shared learning experiences and feelings of isolation. Um, most of us are just trying to keep our heads above water and in general, you know, we're just doing our best and everyone's pretty overwhelmed right now. Um, so I think empathy and understanding of where people are at, are at is really important. And thinking about distance learning, how we normally think of it, even when things are normal, uh, distance education doesn't always measure up, you know, one-to-one -one with traditional face-to-face -face learning. Um, and on a regular basis, we're always comparing it to face-to-face -to -face learning. Um, I've completed, I completed my master's in library science online. I'm doing a master's degree in, um, uh, learning design and technology at UGA right now. Um, and I particularly love distance learning because it's 
flexible and it's I can fit it into my usual home life. But those programs were designed uh, to be online and they're subject areas that are suitable to online learning and that's not necessarily always the case. And so questions about, you know, how does distance learning measure up to face-to-face -face learning? Are, you know, are online degrees as, as good as traditional face-to-face -face degrees? If I'm a student, you know, is this going to look good on my resume? Will I get good experience? Will I get the, the tools, knowledge, and skills that I need? And for instructors, um, the questions are how, how do I teach my subject online? Is it possible? What different approaches do I need to take? And these are all things that normally you think about ahead of time. Um, but with our current situation, we're really, um, you know, the struggle is, is more because of being, not having that time to think about and adapt. And so distance, distance learning does have its shortcomings, um, but it's proven its worth in being able to um, deliver education when being physically present isn't possible or practical. Um, so with distance learning, um, one of its goals is to make education more accessible um, and more available and sustainable to more people. And right now we're seeing very clearly that it's not sustainable. Um, this is stress-tested distance learning and what it is capable of, and we're seeing the points of failure unfold. Um, so, uh, you know, sure, we are not prepared for this. Um, distance learning was never meant for this, um, but it's happening, it's very real, um, and in some ways it's not meeting expectations or needs. Um, but possibly, what if it could? Because all of you are doing an amazing job at striving for academic continuity um, and have shown that online learning can indeed connect people, even if in a very different way that doesn't meet the expectations that were had about how the learning experience would go but it connects people when they're otherwise disconnected um, and shows that distance learning has the potential to reach more people, um, make quality education more accessible and more sustainable, but we need more advanced planning. So, um, and while it might be, uh, never be just like face-to-face -face learning communities, um, you know, it has proven to be essential in this time. So I usually try to be an optimist, um, but right now I'm struggling with that. I'm just kind of keeping on keeping on, like I'm sure a lot of you feel uh, is the case. And, you know, I'm just not in the make lemonade out of lemons mindset yet about it um, because it's, it's kind of scary and overwhelming to uh, have all of this this pressure and time limitations in addition to the distance and isolation. Um, but everything passes and this will pass and I think growth will happen out of this. Uh, it's already happening even if we feel like we're just surviving. Um, a lot of kind of micro innovations are coming out of this experience um, and so that growth is already happening on a small level, even if, you know, we don't recognize it like that. Um, and our ability to adapt is giving life to new ideas and revitalizing old ones. So now we get to the participatory part. Um, I would love to hear about what you have been doing or what you've seen done or things should be done about building and supporting thriving distance learning communities now, right now in the situation that we're in. Um, so Christina posted the Padlet to the chat, and um, this is an opportunity to share your 
wide ranging thoughts on this, whether it's a problem that you personally solved or your team or some colleagues somewhere else or you saw in the news, you know, in terms of supporting faculty and students and, and technologies, um, share uh, what you have learned and achieved thus far, uh, some of those small victories um, and what those problems were and how you solved them. So we're gonna take five minutes to do this. I'm going to play some relaxing classical music while you gather your thoughts and write a little bit and um, also take a look at, at what your peers wrote. Um, I have, I think, about 15 minutes left, so um, we probably won't have a lot of time to review it, but these are going to be um, up perpetually, so you'll be able to reference them later and even add new ideas to it. Um, so uh, go for it. And I will return in about five minutes. Okay, I see some amazing responses and uh, definitely take the time to read through what your peers wrote. Um, and this could be great inspiration for the breakout groups later. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap things up pretty quickly, um, move through the next part, and then we'll do one more Padlet thought exercise and wrap up. Um, for Q&A, um, if we run out of time, um, please put your questions or comments in the chat. And then I created a Padlet where I will post those questions and then comment with a response. So um, moving on, we're feeling the effects of this pandemic uh, and in the loss of educational communities, um, very strongly in a local sense, but it's happening globally. And um, this map is from the UNESCO website, and it shows the impact globally of how many learners are affected, which is over 1.5 billion. 91% um, of all learners in primary, secondary, and higher education, and 191 countrywide clues. And if you go to the website, uh, which is, um, if you just Google UNESCO school closures, you should get to this, or educational impact. Um, this actually, the play button there, um, will start from the beginning of the, um, of the impact and show you the evolution over time, over uh, probably, I think, since February uh, of school closures. And so it's a really interesting visual to see, like, how big this really is. So thinking about, um, you know, how we can make distance education more sustainable on a global scale, um, the UN has developed sustainable development goals, and these were adopted by 193 countries in 2015, and they want to achieve them by 2030. And several of them relate to education and other elements that go hand in hand with education. So this is a call to action for all countries to promote prosperity um, and economic growth worldwide, um, while also 
addressing the fact that we need to protect the planet and use resources carefully. So for quality education, that includes free and equitable primary and secondary school for all children, as well as equal access to affordable and quality technical school, vocational school, and uh, higher education at university and beyond. Um, goal number eight um, that's related is decent work and economic growth. So rethinking policies and structures um, in the effort to eradicate poverty and of course having educational opportunities helps with that. And then goal 10, reducing inequalities in general, focusing on policy, policies that attend to the needs of uh, disadvantaged and marginalized populations, which we are seeing what some of those issues are now in our current situation. So as librarians and educators, we are naturally helping with these things, not just now, but on a regular basis, even if we're not thinking about those broader UN goals consciously. Uh, and what we're doing right now um, is gonna help shape the future of what access to education looks like. And we can't predict what's gonna happen, but we can imagine what that might look like um, and envision what could make for thriving distance education communities um, where distance education is accessible and equitable for everyone. Um, and what are the things that would need to change, be developed to make distance learning sustainable for anyone, anywhere. And so our next thought exercise um, is to think about by the year 2030, when they want to achieve those sustainable development goals, what might distance education look like? What do we need to start doing now to improve those outcomes in terms of distance education? Um, so this is like pie in the sky ideas. It doesn't have to be practical. It can be, you know, related to some technologies or policies that uh, exist now, or it can be something that you just create in your mind that you think is ideal, uh, whether it's for supporting instructors or supporting students or specific technologies. Um, making distance education kind of more uh, similar to face the face-to-face -face experience. Um, so this is a creative exercise. Uh, now it's kind of hard to think that far in the future in general. And right now, you know, we're, we have so much we're dealing with in our current situation, but kind of getting a head start on, you know, once this is all over, like what might we, be able to take out of it and really advance distance learning for the future. So we'll take three to five minutes and then I will wrap up uh, very quickly so you all can have a short break before the breakout sessions. Uh, and again, I will, um, I will be uh, giving out a Padlet uh, as well that will have a Q and A in it. So you can post, you can post your questions on the Padlet or you can post them in chat and I'll put them in the Padlet. Um, and then uh, I will answer them in a comment. So take a little time to uh, fill out that next thought exercise and see what your peers are writing. Um, and again, this will stay up so you can access it later today and uh, moving forward. So.
All right, we'll take maybe another 30 seconds, some minute for you to wrap up your thoughts and uh, then I'll conclude and we can go into a short Q&A before the break. Okay, so um, this is a thought exercise. Again, it might, it's you know, hard to envision what 10 years from now is gonna look like. Um, and some of the ideas you wrote down might not be possible, but that doesn't really matter. It's inspiration for what could be and thinking about our, um, the issues that we're seeing now and how we might address those in the next 10 years. I don't know what the future holds, but I do think that distance learning will be playing a bigger and bigger role in delivering education, meeting educational needs, supporting learning communities, as well as economies. And in the past month, um, I think that we as educators have really shown what we're capable of, uh, whether or not we're accustomed to distance learning. Our adaptability has been incredible and is also highlighting areas where we can grow. And so as you talk in your breakout groups today, I really encourage you to think locally as well as globally uh, and consider how we might be able to come out of the situation better than before. Now, that's not going to be immediate. We're going to need some time to bounce back, but it's going to give us some time to think. We're eventually um, you know, we'll be able to take what we learn and build a better future. There's going to be a lot of improvised innovation in the next several months that we can utilize. Um, distance learning isn't the solution to everything, but it's essential right now. And I think that we can desert, design online learning environments to best serve learning communities all around the world. Um, so these pilots will stay up and uh, you can add your ideas to these boards um, throughout your breakout session. And if you have thoughts later, even weeks later, feel free to, um, you know, add to them and share them with others. I really thank you for the opportunity to share with you today and also learn from your experiences and ideas. Um, and I especially thank you for your hard work. And making sure that your, the people that you serve um, can continue to have a quality academic experience. You're awesome. So I have a little bit of time to answer some questions um, if you want to type it in chat or raise your hand. Um, otherwise, you can post it to the Q&A Padlet uh, that the moderators are sharing in the chat, um, and I can address those later on. Well, if nobody has oh, all right, okay. if nobody has questions right now, again, feel free to think about it. And I'm going to be uh, in the breakout session, so um, we can talk then as well. Thank you so much, and um, enjoy the rest of the sessions.